I think prices need to collapse at least 50% from the top. That's a bare minimum. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. There are a lot of mixed messages out there right now. The economy is strong, yet inflation adjusted retail sales aren't growing. The jobs market is robust, yet more and more of corporate America is announcing layoffs. The housing market is resilient, yet we've just hit a record level of unaffordability and sales transactions are cratering as prices are starting to come down. Which is more correct? Do better or worse days lie ahead of us? To help us clear out the smoke and get a true picture of what's going on, we welcome macro analyst Mike Mish Shedlock back to the program. Mike, thanks so much for joining us today. Adam, thanks for having me back on. Always a pleasure to be on your show. No, oh, it's always fun, Mish. All right, look, I've got a lot of questions for you. You've got a lot of recent content out I want to wade through. Before we do, though, let me just start with the high-level question I like to ask all my guests at the beginning of these interviews. What is your current assessment of the global economy and financial markets? <laughs> in a word, puzzling. I can make a case we're in recession now. I can make a strong case that recession is not going to happen later. And the new meme, of course, is there's no landing at all because there won't be a recession. I can actually make a case for all three of those points of view. But uh, I'm going to stick for now, uh, despite some of the data, that we're either in recession or very near recession. Okay. Um, look, uh, you've got a ton of articles, like I said, that you've been pumping out that are really some fantastic work, Mish. So um, let's just dive right into it. Uh, maybe we should start with um, Fed policy, because that seems to you know drive everything at the end of the day. Uh, you just recently published a piece called A Fed Study Shows Loose Monetary Policy Leads to Disaster and Financial Crisis. Um, there was a particular San Francisco Fed paper that you referenced in the article. Um, the conclusion, maybe you said like, yeah, uh, tell us something else that's additionally you know as obvious as this. But, but why don't you tell us what the results of that article were? Well, the result is that loose money is, you know, always leads to an economic crisis. The San Francisco Fed, you know, went back, you know, all the way to the Great Depression, and then they weeded things out. So they weeded the Great Depression out. Let's not look at that. They just went back and they, they looked at, you know, all of the more or less normal things here. Um, and and their conclusion is hardly surprising. The references were amazing. There's like, you know, they referred to like maybe 150 separate studies, Adam, you know, uh, uh, pretty much all concluding the same thing or a piece of something that led to that conclusion. But the most interesting thing to me was the chart that I posted. I think it was called chart six, I, if, if I can uh, recall correctly. And it was the time lag of when loose money policy starts to matter. And it was right around 10 years. And you know that matches what happened now that happened uh, uh, heading into the dot-com recession, where, you know, back then Greenspan, you know, in 19, I think it was 1994 or 96, you know, warned about excessive exuberance. But then by the year 2000, he believed in this productivity miracle. And, you know, he was worried about the economy overheating right as it was about ready to collapse. And then if we look at the wake of that recession starting in 2001, I mean, it was obvious to all of us by 2006 that the Fed had blown this massive, massive, massive housing bubble. But of course, they didn't then, and they still don't now, consider housing part of inflation. And something I've written about many times is that inflation matters, not just what they call consumer inflation, which I don't even believe they measure properly. But and lo and behold, so what did we have about an eight year time frame, maybe, you know, where it just it just all started to unravel in 2008. 
Yet Bernanke was saying everything's still under control. And, and then the Fed, in the wake of the Great Recession, tried for a decade to produce inflation. They wanted to make up, of all things, for lack of past inflation. Guess what? They finally got their wish right about 10 years later, right? So that was the, the, the interesting thing about the study is, is that like, you know, six to 11 years after we have bad monetary policy, we have a crisis. I think we're in a crisis now. Okay, and a couple of questions coming off of this, but, but maybe the biggest one is, is do you feel that the, the period we're in right now is the early innings of the reckoning from the loose monetary policy that that started that the campaign coming out of the global financial crisis, the early innings. Of, well, we had a reckoning. We should have had a reckoning twice, right? Right. But they keep blowing another bubble to try and fix the imbalances that they created. It's not just the Fed, of course. President, you know, to not play politics, both presidents Trump. And Biden contributed to this problem with fiscal stimulus. Now, Biden's was bigger than the other two combined and the worst one. And he's continuing now with policies that I think can't help but cause inflation. But who do you blame more for this? Do you blame the politicians or do you blame the Fed for contributing <laughs> Bill piling on top of, of what the governments did with policies that blew another big housing bubble, but they don't see the inflation in it because they don't count housing as inflation. So, you know, I have to blame the Fed more. And there was a debate on Twitter the other day, uh, uh, with, you know, who was the worst and and uh, uh, a guy, I, Rudy Haverstein, uh, posts some amazingly funny tweets all the time. He's just absolutely hilarious. He proposed it was Greenspan. Someone replied to him. He thought it was, you know, Bernanke. Of course, you know, you, know, you can always find someone here. Yellen has been pre preposterous. But Bernanke, who claimed to be a student of the Great Recession, you know, the, the irony of that to me was staggering. I, I, I would I would side with Bernanke if I had to pick one. OK. And, and yeah, and the Fed is supposed to be independent, right? You can sort of right. say, hey, look, you know, the, the presidency can lurch back and forth from partisan side to partisan side, and it's going to do whatever is politically advantageous at the moment. But the Fed's supposed to be the adult in the room. Right. Um, all right. But but um, I'm going to restate my question again, which is, um, you know, we, we, we had the, the dot com bubble. Right. And then yeah. we we leaned into the failed policies again. Right. We doubled down on them. That then created the, the housing bubble and then the, the great the global financial crisis. And then we kind of tripled down into the same policies afterwards. Right. And that lasted for about a decade. Right. And then now, starting last year, you know, we're beginning to see things either go off the rails or threaten to go off the rails. Um, and, and I want to just ask you again. So do you feel the, the period we're in right now is sort of the beginning of the reckoning of this most recent decade of, of leaning into these flawed policies? And, you know, if you want to argue that loose monetary policy creates financial distress, I don't know if we've ever had a period that's been as loose as the 10 years leading up to 2022. Right. But, the, you know, the, the key thing was, is this the beginning of the reckoning? I think so. And there's reasons for that. And the, but the primary reason for that is um, the Fed has always had um, globalization um, uh, at its at its back. Yeah, it, 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 it's had like an out. It's it's it, it's had this. Yeah, this this tailwind or this kind of get out of jail free card that globalization was out there just keeping prices nice and low. And global wage average, that was the word. If you looked at, if you saw me struggling, you know, what is it I want to say? It's global wage average. So g globalization and global wage arbitrage, you know, kept a lid um, on, you know, inflation. And so did for a while rising productivity. Now, what do we have? We have falling productivity because um, boomers are retiring in mass here 
or cutting down their hours. Some of them are still trying to work. Look, you know, look at me. I'm I'll be 70 this year and I have no plans of retiring ever, actually. But uh, um, the uh, huge percentage of people, I mean, you just look at the labor force participation rates, stop, you know, working once they get 65 or cut down their hours. Their labor participation rate falls from, I think, 55% down to, I'm going to make up some numbers here, so don't hold me to them, something like 17 or 18%, you know, or 20% maybe, by the time they get to uh, 65. And we have a huge number of people, 20 million that are, that are, that are moving from this demographic, you know, 59 to 64 into the 65 plus, you know, just in this year alone, we're going to have a um, labor force, uh, um, a, a non-institutional population rise of 2 million in all of that. All of that entire 2 million increase is 65 and older. So to me, it's no wonder we're struggling for jobs. It's no wonder when you're struggling for jobs and you hire marginal people that productivity goes down. We have um, uh, deglobalization, which every time I mention that, people tell me, well, it's barely starting. And if I look, I have to agree. It's barely starting. <laughs> what is that? What does it mean, though? That means it's going to get worse. worse. Yeah. W worse in terms of uh, upwards pressure on wages. Yes. Yes, exactly. All right. And, well, look. Um, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, you're, you're treading into territory that I want to get into with you, but maybe a little bit later, because you and I have gone back and forth in the past about what we think is going to happen with the unemployment rate going yes. forward. But but I, I want to flag the point you're making here, which is that um, uh, you know these are inflationary uh, trends that you're talking about, and uh, that is kind of the new ball game for central banks. Whereas you know right. they, they didn't have to worry about it, and in fact, well, not since when 1980, you know, yeah. Or and they talked about seeking it, like you said, yes, right? like you know we we have quotes from Yellen and other past Fed heads of like we we, we kind of need a little bit more inflation right now, of course. They got everything they asked for and then way more. Um, so uh, so that obviously is going to hamstring their ability to, to deal with this problem because a lot of the tools they used in the past, they could use because they didn't have to worry about inflation. Now they do. Right. Um, th there's one other point from that article I want to just give you a chance to, uh, to opine on, which was this concept called the Fed uncertainty principle. Okay, yes. So can you just explain what that is for folks? Well, it's, I, I wrote this post in, uh, I think it was March of, of 2008, right before the uh, Great Recession hit. I was I'm really proud of it. A hedge fund manager wrote me after that, and he said he made every one of his staff read that article. And it's essentially, it is, you, you know, all eyes are on the Fed trying to game the system. You know, there's this idea that, that well, the Fed really uh, doesn't set interest rates. The market sets interest rates. Well, the Fed steers the market in the direction it wants to go. And then everybody piles on. This is why I'm against forward guidance, by the way. Is, um, is it exasperates the trend. So the Fed stakes out this position and you know they did it again or have done it many times if you look, because you know they kept saying, well, it's transitory, it's transitory, it's transitory. Well, the market eventually bats on you know, this thing being transitory forever. You know, and uh, uh, the Fed you know, announced, it gave its timelines you know, of, of how long it was going to keep this latest round of quantitative easing going. Well, the market picks up on that, right? And drives that, you know, bubble, you know, further and further. This is, you know, one of the things, one of the reasons why probably it takes 10 years, you know, be be before it finally just doesn't work anymore. But, you know, my corollaries to the Fed uncertainty principle are, you know, are the Fed really doesn't know what it's doing, but, you know, you know, so it blows these crises and then it repeats the same policy makes 
uh, uh, is, is, is corollary number two. And, and, you know, all the while, it really doesn't know, you know, what it's doing. I, there's, there's, there's four principles, four corollaries to this. Unfortunately, I don't remember all of them off the top of my head, but I remember one of them is that it, you know, just keeps repeating mistakes you know, over and over again, while not really even understanding here, in this case, what inflation really is, because it doesn't include the asset bubbles it blows. But over time, this is, I think, corollary number three, it usurps more and more power, you know, to do the things that it wants to do, to keep in control. It, it, if we go back to the great financial crisis, they suspended mark to market accounting. They did some things that I believe were blatantly illegal. Uh, John Hussman has talked about, you know, uh, uh, this latest round buying junk bonds. You know, that's not in their mission, but it's, you know, they will act, it will usurp authority. And such that over time, greater and greater amounts of authority are in the hands of people who literally don't know what they're doing. Okay. <laughs> All right. So then that gets to my next question, which is, um, you know, we, we don't get to live with the Fed that we want. We get to live with the Fed that we have, right? Yes. And so... Um, where, where do you think, pro probability-wise, what do you expect to happen going forward from here for the rest of the year with Fed policy? You know, right now, the Fed is is locked in a game of chicken with the markets around higher for longer, right? First the off, Fed is is yeah. desperately saying, guys, look, we're going to do this. It's continuing to give forward, forward guidance. You know, we're going to give a couple more rate hikes, maybe go a little bit higher than the initial five we thought. And we're going to hang out there for the rest of the year, wait to see what the lag effect of everything we've done is. And the yeah. markets just seem to be saying, nope, we don't believe you. We think you're going to pivot a lot sooner than that. Right. Well, first off, let's talk about some things I've been wrong about, because I certainly haven't been right about everything and no one has been right about everything. And um, but, you know, my initial you know, position was that we were just going to have this, you know, demand destruction that was the, the Fed would not get to where I now think it's going. The uh, and position was just wrong. And, and uh, I've had others and other people, some of your guests, uh, I won't even espouse them because, you know, I'd rather point out my mistakes and have other people <laughs> point out their own mistakes and have people point out mistakes for them. But uh, there were others in that boat too. And I, I think there's still some people, you know, in that boat, but really, you know, we're kind of all guessing uh, 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 about where, the, where this goes. And I did a post um, uh, the, the, the other day talking about service inflation. And, uh, you know, it came back with a vengeance. Spending came back. Now, did spending really come back? Or was this, um, um, what do you call it, gift cards at Christmas that were postponed and delayed that spending into January, compounded by good weather? I mean, okay, that's possible. But another thing that's possible is, is that people have just given up. Zoomers have given up. They're no, you know, they've given up on this idea that they're ever going to be able to save enough money to buy a home. And I posted that as a theory for, you know, supporting more consumption. And I got a surprising answer back from, uh, not surprising, but an unexpected answer back uh, from uh, one of my readers on Twitter was he's got, you know, three daughters, you know, 19, 23 or so. They've moved back home. They have uh, 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 have additional money to spend on travel and eating out and services and other things because of price, precisely what I just said. You know, there's a, you know what? No matter what we do, we're not going to be able to save enough money to buy a house. So let's have fun now. And there easily could be some of this going on. And that's one of the things here that the Fed is fighting. The Fed got what it wanted. And now it doesn't know how to turn it off. So, you know, if that keeps up, and I don't know if it will, 
But if that keeps up, we still don't have enough rate hikes priced into this because of uh, uh, of, of things that are going on in, you know, deglobalization, uh, Biden's energy policy, hugely inflationary, Biden's policies on labor, the labor, national labor force, you know, or national labor relations board, hugely inflationary, his, his tactics on regulation, inflationary, up and down the line. You see inflation, 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 inflation. The Fed is fighting all of that and now is fighting the, attitor- the attitudes of workers, which is act your wage, quiet quitting, it, it, you know, spend now because we can't save, we can't possibly save up for a house. Okay, so um, you're making arguments here basically that, that, you know, inflation may be tougher to tame than the Fed initially hoped, and therefore mm-hmm. higher for longer might need to be even higher for even longer at this point. Um, you know, I feel like you can make the argument too that if the Fed paused today, right, they didn't do any more rate hikes, just with the lag effects of all the rate hikes that have been made so far that we haven't fully felt in the economy, that there's a pretty good argument you can make that the economy can't withstand, you know, the Fed funds rate where it is today <laughs> and stand up to the impact of those lag effect shockwaves that are still coming in here. So obviously future rate hikes are just going to make the gravity pulling down economic growth uh, even stronger going forward here. So like this is kind of where you get to, you know, the probabilities of a recession. You said you can kind of make right. at least straw man arguments for each of those yes, three, three cases, three hard, soft, and none. But But I mean, to me, it's sort of like, Probability wise, it's hard not to see a recession coming given everything that you just mentioned. Absolutely. I mean, that's my, that's my base case. And when I say, you know, I can make those positions, um, um, one of them stands out. And that is a recession is, is, is coming uh, uh, eventually, you know, no matter what. So, yeah, you can actually make a case. And there's some people that I follow on Twitter that is that is exactly, you know, what the Fed should do. Just, just stall it out here now, and eventually it's, it, it's going to happen. But you know, they they they're they're trying here desperately to maintain credibility here that they shouldn't have at all. You know, as inflation fighters, when they're one of the biggest causes of inflation, because precisely because they have no idea what it even is. But uh, 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 yeah, you know, they're they're also fighting politics. You know, they're they're fighting, you know, a Biden administration that wants to get inflation down while doing everything it can to cause it as well. And then you have, you know, uh, the likes of Elizabeth Warren, you know, wanting the Fed to take on climate change policy as as part of their mandate. Now, the Fed struck out against that. But, you know, yeah, I, I think. I think you know we're heading that direction of, of recession. There's not going to be a soft landing here. The the what is gained, you know, by by delaying it, do we make matters worse? And maybe that's what the Fed is arguing with themselves here now. Is are we making it worse ultimately if we do? you know, if, if we're just too slow. Certainly the Fed is very fearful of, uh, uh, at least in their writings, at least what they're saying, uh, of, of not wanting to cut too quickly, you know, once we do get into recession, out of fear of, of, of stoking uh, um, inflation again. And that's a very, very realistic fear, you know, uh, 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 actually. And um, but, you know, the, the, the timing here, which is one of the things that, you know, you alluded to just from where we at are, you know, what the Fed has done uh, uh, is this timing, you know, issue. But when does timing start? Does it start at 2% or does it start from the bottom? Did the first 
two percentage points of hikes do anything at all? Or are we really just now looking at a delay that started once the Fed got to a certain rate, say two or two and a half percent? I don't know the answer to that. I don't personally think that the rate should ever be below. Well, I personally think the market should set the rates. Mm -hmm. uh, but would would a market set a rate below two percent? You know, certainly, probably not in this environment of fiscal deficits that we have. So we'll see. All right. So I'm, I'm going to ask you some rapid fire questions here, yeah. getting to to another set of questions. So I'm going to preface all this by saying that, Mike, we'll have you back on long before, often as you like, to call, you know, audibles and, and, and change the, your outlook uh, based upon new data. Um, but if we are at the beginning of the reckoning, kind of what inning would you put us in it right now? One. Okay, two, one. Two so maybe. early on. So yeah. this is something that you see unfolding over the course of this year, probably bleeding into 2024 as well? Um, I, I think so. Um, but we don't know how fast it can accelerate. And, you know, we don't even know where a crisis is going to happen. Um, Japan is a likely target. The EU is still at risk of busting up. We have a German economic implosion. They're a manufacturing powerhouse that has now just, you know, morphed in the, their car production. I don't know if you've seen these articles, but the car production out of China and their good quality cars, electric vehicles, have, has, has just taken the world here, you know, by storm. We don't see it because those aren't coming into the U.S., but they are going into the EU. German manufacturing is on a decline. Certainly, they're closer to the 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 war in Ukraine than we are here. Yet we're the ones funding it all. Um, so, uh, uh, and then China, you know, they've got a five percent growth target. The only way China can make that growth target is to keep doing the things that they've been doing wrong for the last decade. So when does China blow up? So I think we're going to I think we're headed for a currency crisis. I don't know where it starts. I People always assume it's going to start in the United States. My assumption is it's going to start somewhere else. But when and where, I don't know. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if it started three months from now. And if it does, that's going to move my timeline as to where we are. Okay, great. And as, as the picture becomes clear, like I said, we'll, we'll, we'll have you back on here again. Okay, so um, so obviously the, the Fed is tightening into this future that mm -hmm. we're talking about here, right? Um, let, let's say at some point it does become apparent that, all right, we, we are entering uh, recession, right? We're not, we're not debating the definition of a recession. We're not saying, well, look, we've got, you know, several past good, you know, uh, quarters of GDP growth. I just looked at GDP now before hopping on here with you. It's still over 2% at this point in time. 2.3, I think, yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, so let's say we get to a point later this year where it's like, okay, all that's all that's in the past. We can really tell now that that we're, we're heading down into this thing. Um, <sighs> and I know I'm asking you to prognosticate here, but do you see it more being sort of a traditional recession or more of a stagflationary one, right? Where economic growth is really contracting, but these inflationary challenges that we're dealing, you know, we've been dealing with are, are still around. It's almost kind of the worst of both worlds. Yeah, um, you asked a couple of questions there, um, uh, uh, but uh, you know, let me touch on this. Will the Fed even recognize we're in recession? Actually, that's quite debatable. The uh, in March of 2008, Bernanke denied we were in recession. So uh, uh, and <laughs> it was the bottom was about ready to fall out right when he made that statement. So, you know, will the Fed recognize recession? No. I, well, we don't know whether they will or not. You know, just as, you know, the, the Fed kept thinking that, you um, uh, uh, disinflation or inflation was transitory, and you know they kept QE going to the bitter end. 
you know, all the way to you know, March of, you know, all the way to March, right before they were ready to cut, when, when the housing bubble was obvious to everyone, the Fed still hadn't picked up on it. So will the Fed pick up on the fact that we're in recession? I, I certainly wouldn't count on it. Now, okay, that was the first thing. So repeat <laughs> your other question again now, because I forgot it. <laughs> oh, okay. So is do you expect it to be like once we're really oh, in, yes. right? You know, is, is it going to be more like a traditional recession or is it going to be a stagflationary one? Well, every recession is different. So um, right now, it, it, I mean, if if you take my theory that we're in recession right now, or might be, or at least close to it, what else would you call it but stagflation? So uh, uh, certainly we're in, uh, you know, unbalanced growth. You know, we've never seen these, we've never seen housing conditions be like this, industrial production conditions be like this, uh, uh, real consumer spending be like this without us being in recession. Yet when you add it all up, somehow you get 2% growth, <laughs> if you believe that. Now see, is that believable? Right. Uh, there's always revisions, you know, heading into and out of recessions. And right now, those are, you know, I am expecting revisions to be hugely negative, which might say, you know, what, you know, guess what? All of this stuff that we've been saying was, you know, looked good really wasn't good. That, would that surprise me at all? No. So, you know, there's your stagflation case. But this, we're certainly not going to have a, at least in my opinion, a, a repeat of the Great Recession. Because back then we had, you know, liar loans on houses we don't have. We had people walking away from mortgages. I don't, I, I, I don't foresee that again. It's going to be the opposite of the COVID recession. The COVID recession was extremely short. Two months, right? And unprecedentedly deep in terms of job losses. I'm expecting the opposite of that. And if it's the exact opposite of that, it's also going to be unlike any other recession we've ever had before. Okay. So, and it, when it, you say uh, the opposite, so obviously it's going to be prolonged and not yes, short. Very long. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In and out, in and out of recession for you know, three years, just weakness for a long time, um, um, near recession, you know, or recession as the Fed fights inflation. That's sort of a, you know, not the stagflationary spike that we saw in, two th uh, um, um, in you know, 1970s, 1980s, but a stagflationary, you know, period malaise where the Fed can't generate growth without stoking inflation. That's something we really haven't seen. We've seen the, the stagflation. We've seen the um, deflation. <laughs> I don't know what else to call it of the Great Recession. So um, in that sense, I'm expecting something a little bit different than what we've had before. Okay, and so here, here's where I'm going then. And again, we're, we're talking probabilities here, folks, right? So I'm, I'm really forcing Mike to posticulate, pontificate here. Um, so if it is more stagflationary of a recession, um, it, it limits what the Fed can do, like you just yes. said, right? The Fed can't come in with its usual bazookas and start firing because- that's, that's precisely why it's going to be a long one, right? Right. Well, so, okay, exactly. So what does that really mean? Right. So, okay. So uh, obviously those inflationary pressures will, will hurt consumer spending, right? Um, we're a majority consumer spending economy, right? So that's going to continue to hurt earnings, right? So earnings compression will likely continue. Yes. Mm -hmm. We're already seeing layoffs accelerate here, right? That layoff wave likely to continue in that type of inflationary recession world, yes. right? We'll we'll duke it out over the unemployment rate in, in a few minutes here. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, what I'm just trying to do is to give people a sense of what type of future to start preparing for. And you know, from what I'm seeing through your lens is, yeah, like a really painful, prolonged uh, period where 
um, the economy is going to contract. Um, jobs are going to, you know, become less plentiful, and we can duke that, you know, duke that out in just a moment here. Home prices are likely going to continue to correct due to all this, uh, and there's lower. probably going to be a bear lower. market bottom in there that's lower than what we saw last year, right? Mm -hmm. I think so. Um, I, I don't think the stock market is priced for any of this stuff. I, I, I really don't. And um, I never thought we'd see the bubble we saw. And it's not just stocks. I, I, I'm sorry, there's a bubble in crypto. I, you, know, you can tell me that, that um, Bitcoin's going to go to a million dollars or whatever. And you know what? It's possible. It's possible. But I just don't think so. Um, it's also possible that Bitcoin goes to a thousand or even 500. That's possible too. Uh, I don't want to get into debates with people over what the odds are there of that. But I will just make a point here that if the Fed ever feels threatened by Bitcoin, there are things they can do to make it very painful for Bitcoin holders. Okay. I, I, it's, am it's amazing to me that that is even up for debate, but it is in Twitter sphere where there's this prevailing attitude in that space that absolutely nothing can stop Bitcoin. You know, that in and of itself, Adam, is a bubble belief. Now, we will see. I mean, if the Fed is not threatened by it, who knows where it goes? But um, Bitcoin has never been in an environment except with liquidity at its back. So this is the first real test. And we'll see whether I'm right or they're right, or maybe none of us are right and something else happens, like Bitcoin just stabilizes here you know, uh, uh, at this price range for a decade. It, it's possible. All these things are possible. But the interesting thing to me is people in that sphere, you know, I didn't mean to morph into Bitcoin, but here we are. So I'll continue. Just have this amazing belief that there is no scenario other than Bitcoin goes to the moon that's possible. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm going to interject for a couple of reasons. One, um, we're, we're in danger of getting run off the rails in this conversation by all the people who are on the Bitcoin bandwagon who... Mm -hmm you know, we'll definitely react to this. So um, to, to you try can not edit to have it the, out if you like. Try not to have, no, no, no. To try not to have the, the discussion hijacked by those folks. Uh, I'm going to move on because you mentioned a couple other really interesting things that I want to pull on here. And, and I am going to get back to your market outlook, right? When you said you don't think stocks are priced for any of what's coming. Um, I want to do or Bitcoin. Sense. I mean, you know, that's how it all came about, right? Yeah. Yeah. When you're saying Bitcoin's an example of, of the fact that in your mind, the bubble, you know, is still not, is still alive today because right. we, we, we've got money there. I will say just on the Bitcoin thing, if you want to better understand Mike's position on it, go read his Twitter feed because he's quite recently had some threads on there that really elaborate his thinking. Um, but anyways, I do want to get back to your market outlook. But before that, um, two things. One, you, you mentioned you know liquidity as a function of what drives a bubble here. Right. And um, it, it, when you look at global capital flows, global liquidity, um, it is pretty highly correlated with asset prices and, and, and the price of the S&P. And, you know, it's no surprise in hindsight that when the Fed turned off the QE spigot uh, and the financial stimulus spigots got turned off more or less at the same time, you know, the S&P then all of a sudden started coming down from its peak, right? Gold, um, now the markets, the, the markets have, have rallied since October, Right. Mm -hmm. And there haven't been a ton of data points to point to and say, oh, this is the reason for this recovery. It, yet, relatively recent charts have come out, um, I believe, from Matt King, who I think writes for Bloomberg. I'm going to try to track this down. If I can, folks, I'll put it up here. Um, but it basically showing that global net liquidity has gone positive again around October, largely due to China's uh stimulating. Um, there's some other factors in there that are contributing, but it seems to be China being the, the biggest issue on that. So I'm just curious, I'd just love for you to opine both on, um, like, is liquidity the essential yeast of an asset bubble? And um, if if we are in a temporary positive liquidity mode globally, 
do you think that'll sustain for much longer or do you think that recedes and, and does it need to recede to have the type of recession that we're talking about? I think um, negative real yields are one of the drivers. And as long as home prices stay elevated here, and there's reasons to believe that they're going to stay elevated for a while. And again, the Fed caused this and the Fed is going to have to suffer through this um, long period of stagflation because of it. So uh, the, and, uh, the reason why housing is gonna stay elevated is because it's, this is not a replay of 2008. The Fed, when they slashed interest rates all the way down to zero, one could refinance their mortgage easily. And they had a many year or about a year period in which they could do this. And I believe almost everybody who owned a house did, had a mortgage did, was refinance at, you know, somewhere between two and a half and three percent, maybe 3.25 percent. Now, I didn't look today, but the last time I looked, rates were right 7% again. Yeah. So um, these people were able to refinance. What happened? The, the, the Fed, by driving rates so low, made a huge asset bubble in housing. People were able to refinance. And that refinancing put hundreds of dollars a month back in their pockets now that they can spend on every, on anything. And they, and that is one of the things here that's supporting, you know, so home prices falling, eh, you know, they don't care. They're, well, some of them do. Someone who wants to move is, you know, stuck in their home. Who, who wants to trade a seven, you know, a, a two and a half or 3% mortgage for a 7%. So in essence, you know, they're stuck and you can see it. The housing inventory is coming off the line, but um, the Fed to fight this inflation and, and we, we still have student loan forgiveness and all these other programs of, of, of Biden and, and his policies on unions, uh, 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 stoking inflation. So the, the uh, uh, people are taking extra part-time jobs and spending it. And this idea that I had that people have given up buying a house. And so, you know, they've just decided rather than save for a house now, you know, we're going to, we're going to travel. Go all on that vacation things, or buy that extra car. Yeah. Yeah. All of these things are, 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 you know, uh, uh, acting to, you know, stimulate you know, inflation, which are acting to keep the Fed higher for longer. And if you don't have a robust housing sector, you don't have family formation, you, you, you don't have, you know, a lot of other things, you don't have growth. We talked about the productivity of retiring boomers. The, the, uh, th this is why I'm seeing this, the Fed is going to be struggling to uh, well, with below trend growth or in and out of growth. And I wrote that, I made that comment back in July. And uh, about three months later, Powell said, um, we expect to have a prolonged period of weakness. So maybe he finally gets it, but these guys never admit, you know, they're in a mistake. So you have this prolonged period of weakness here that, that, um, the market, for whatever reason, just hasn't priced in. Instead, you know, they're looking at, oh, you know, maybe growth isn't so bad. And that's what's supporting the stock market here in the near term. China coming on, oil still stuck in a sideways channel. I don't know. I think the Piper just hits the fan. Either we're in it right now, we don't know it because the, because the data is going to be revised lower or you know, along with how I think you might be thinking, um, we're, we're just on this verge of this cliff and we don't know what that straw is, you know, that's going to put it in. But it, it's not really a straw that's going to do it. It's just the accumulation of, of all the imbalances that led up to this and then the long period of slow hikes. You know, uh, uh, Greenspan, if you just look, stair step, stair step, stair step, stair step, stair step, a quarter of a step at a time. Then all of a sudden, by my measure of real interest rates, which is 
um, uh, substituting housing uh, uh, for rent in the CPI. We went from negative 5% to positive 4% in, th in three years. <laughs> if, if that would happen again, we're going to have the same kind of reaction. Okay. Um, so I'm going to summarize all that just by saying it doesn't sound like you think there's a global wave of net positive liquidity that's no. going to come and save the asset bubble anytime soon. Um, I want to I want to just mention just just to stir things up. Um, I put out a really just a mental exercise on Twitter um, the other day, and it, it created a lot of uh, discussion. I'm just curious to get your reaction to it, which is, um, you know, everybody. Yeah, the, the, the market thinks that the Fed's going to pivot sooner than the Fed thinks, right? The, the Fed thinks that it's going to hang in there and, and you know, be tough for now. Um, I think most of the analysts that I talk to think that the Fed means it, but that the Fed may eventually be forced to pivot because of, quote unquote, something breaking, right? Uh -huh. That like something really systemically important breaks and then the Fed is forced to pivot. Now, under those conditions, as I've said many times in this channel, if the Fed pivots for those reasons, I don't think they're going to be reasons that are bullish for stocks. So I right. think that the bulls that are hoping for that are going to be disappointed. Here's my question, though. The one thing I it's sometimes just like to try to try to think of the most contrarian thought I can think of. Right. What's the one thing that nobody nobody is thinking of? You're what if the Fed me? broke something okay, and yeah. then didn't come into rescue? Oh, yes. So no rate cuts. No QE, you know, even though the system is quote unquote kind of like melting down. I don't think that's going to happen, but I can tell you it is on nobody's radar right now. So I, I'd awesome. love to have you react to that, but but maybe more more realistically, if the Fed breaks something, do you expect that they have to come in and, and rescue it? And if so, what do you think are the candidates for breaking? How big is the break? So the 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 scenario that you describe is has been in actually has been in my head for a long time. And um, which one, the Fed not coming into the rescue or yes, the Fed not coming into the rescue? It depends, really? even if it breaks something, even if it breaks something. The question is, breaks what? If the Fed breaks the credit market, it's 100 percent guaranteed they will come in. They will support the banks. If the Fed just, you know, causes, you know, this recession and the housing bust lasts longer, I don't think that'll do it. Now they may, you know, they may say, okay, we've, we've done enough, but then what does come in mean? This is, this is, um, you know, my scenario longstanding that when the fed, you know, does come back in, it's the, they're, they're not, they're going to at least try not to repeat the mistakes that they made cutting too much, too fast for too long. And um, and those are what, like looking at the 70s as an example? Um, no, just looking at, at, at what happened in, in 2008 and looking at, at the reaction to um, the uh, COVID pandemic, where, uh, um, you, you know, I, I think they've got a tattoo etched in their head here, whether, whether, they need it or not, that they don't want to restoke inflation. They've said that many, many, many times. So I think they are going to be slow to cut, very slow to cut here, I th unless they break the credit markets. So you said, unless they break something. Well, okay. what is that something? But that, so that, that's a great answer, though. The credit markets, the banking systems under threat, they step in, but yes. the markets are in meltdown. The, the, the housing bust continues deeper than folks imagined. You're saying in those two cases, they actually they want the sidelines. They want housing prices to come down. They, they just haven't got it. So I, I even think uh, that they want a stock market bust and are probably, they just can't come out and say, it. Uh, they've really hinted at that, though. Uh, I mean, I'm says to pain. I mean, we've not had many Fed chairs say that directly. Yeah, but but just recall, you know, Bernanke, someone asked Bernanke directly. I, I, I don't know the year of this. And and um, 
it, you know, it was, you know, the, the stock market supports consumption, you know, was, 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 was his answer. And, you know, for, for, uh, you know, getting things back up, you know, again, they wanted another bubble. They didn't, they didn't want the bubble as big as they have, but again, they have a really hard time um, understanding the bubbles that they blew and how big they are. Now, if, <laughs> this might be a big if, um, that they realize they, they actually did blow this bubble here, then they're going to want it to deflate. But then what does that do to pension plans? I mean, this is a whole other, you know, uh, uh, discussion. And, and then part of what we don't know is who's going to win the White House in 2024, what the economic environment looks like at that time, because the, the Fed can't constrain easily some of the politics that comes out of Washington, D.C. Right. It can't one of the things they're system. fighting now is this very, very inflationary push towards EVs. Right. Um, so, yes, there is a whole fiscal side of the story. Is it a how safe of an assumption is it to think that through now, through the presidential election, fiscal spend, new fiscal spending will be constrained just because we have a divided uh, executive, no, divided uh, Congress? Um, that's pretty much a given, I think. They will, you know, if there's some sort of systemic threat, you know, from China or elsewhere, then there will be a big, you know, military spending boost somewhere along the lines. And by the way, both Republicans and Democrats, you know, are are are, are typically always in favor of, of of increasing Democrat spending. Biden actually asked for more than the Defense Department wanted, you know, this last year. So um, uh, uh, that but the other things that he wants, uh, he's going to struggle with. Yet he's doing some of them by mandate. You know, he's uh, uh, gotten, you know, the EPA to go along with stuff he's wanted to do and, and his student loan forgiveness. And by the way, this can really come into play here because um, stu uh, uh, people who have had all of this extra money to spend, I, I'm positive, you know, I could be wrong, but uh, 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 I think the Supreme Court's going to strike that down. And, you know, uh, people who had extra money to spend eating out or whatever are going to have to start paying back student loans. So, um, you know, that's something that we can see on the horizon that's, you know, going to impact consumer spending at least a bit. So, you know, we'll see. And if eviction moratoriums are still going on in some places, my gosh, um, if that ends, at, you know, at the same time. And then we can just, we never know when people are going to panic. All of a sudden, if, you know, look at what happened back in 2006 and seven, we went from lines people standing around the corner for blocks on end for the right to enter a lottery to buy a Florida condo. One week later, the lines are just all gone. We don't know. I still don't know what triggered that. Nothing, actually. It's just sentiment can finally change on a dime. And if it does, it's all over next month. So all of these things here that we're you know, you know, discussing of, 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 you know, of, the, of the support and the Fed and that, it can all easily change for reasons we don't even understand. Just so right. changes. So I, I got to start beginning to wrap this up, but I have a couple of important topics I want to get through. And, and you're beginning to answer one of them, which is, what do you expect is going to be the lived experience of the average American through this period that we're entering? And I want to preface this by saying, you know, we, we kind of had a decade of salad days, right? From mm -hmm. 2010 to end of 2021, right? Where like, you know, it's just increasing prosperity and everybody's 401ks went up like clockwork every year and, you know, unemployment was low. And I mean, it was pretty, pretty darn good time. Um, uh, and then we had the the pandemic, which was a horrible time, but but 
you know, a lot of people lost their jobs initially, um, but most of them have been hired back. There was a ton of support during that time period and all those relief programs, several of which are still around to this day, like you said, Mish. Um, so, you know, it sounds like we're now entering and, and, and certainly asset prices of all stripes, you know, rebounded on steroids uh, due to the response then, right? Mm -hmm. So it's really only now that the the party feel is dissipating and the hangover is beginning to set in, right? So we had, uh, you know, our, our stock portfolios come down a bit last year, not quite bear market correction, but come down a bit. Um, uh, you know, cost of living has now gone up and it's uncomfortably high for a lot of people. Um, but, you know, jobs have, have hung in there at least until recently, right? And um, the markets haven't fallen off a cliff or anything like that. But what I hear you saying is, is well, expect a number of shoes to drop from here, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, expect things to get worse economically, expect the layoffs to continue, expect the cost of living not to dissipate very much, expect a lot of these support programs that remain to be withdrawn, which is going to further constrict consumer spending. Um, so, you know, it, it sounds like, and, and I'm just asking this because I want to, people to know what to gird for, but it sounds like you're saying probability isn't bad, that we should gird for like a real grind ahead of us, right? Where like, you know, asset prices aren't doing anything fun, you know, uh, home prices continue to come down, but, but rents aren't you know, decreasing super fast and the cost of groceries isn't decreasing super fast. And maybe now we get into the discussions about what the unemployment rate is going to look like, but people are going to become more fearful, I think, of their income stability going forward. Like, this sounds like kind of a multi-year winter that we need to really gird for, one that we haven't had to feel since at least the last global financial crisis. All right. Um, what age group, what demographic, and what wealth group? So, um, well, it, 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 down it, quickly through each. We got all watching this. Yeah, ex ex exactly. And I was, and I was uh, getting ready to go through that. You know, if you have a house and you're not really leveraged into it, and you uh, uh, refinanced, and you have this extra money coming in, you know, you're gonna you're mu gonna muddle through as long as you keep your job or not. You know, uh, planning on retiring. You know, you're you're you might muddle through okay. At the high end, you know, if, if you're worth, you know, tens of millions of dollars and you lose half of it is uh, you're going to still be fine. You're, you're still going to be great. And you'll probably come out further ahead on a relative basis, potentially, depending on how badly everybody else gets hit. But yeah, um, quite possible. Now, if you're at the low end, you're already miserable. You don't have any assets. You're renting. You know, uh, um, um, maybe maybe there's no change for you either. You just stay miserable, okay? But um, the uh, uh, a zoomer who had these hopes of of the great American dream of of buying the house, you know, they're they might be dashed, and there's not going to be a quick recovery for them. As long, unless, unless the Fed can crash housing prices, and and will they? But a crash of housing prices, if they manage to do that, will would actually wipe out a lot of the wealth or the perceived wealth of a huge percentage of the middle class. So you know that's the problem that the Fed is is facing you know even if they can prevent this um uh, uh credit crisis that would cause them to act all right so let, let, let me ask this question um related to when i asked earlier um so it seems clear to me from what pal has been saying for almost a year now is that the fed has declared war on the jobs market right where he's basically said we've got you know way more positions than yes. we have applicants. And I got this dual mandate, but right now I'm putting inflation as priority number one, two, and yes. three. So I'm willing to sacrifice the jobs market to get inflation under control, mm -hmm. right? Do you feel, based on what you said earlier and what you said just now, is the Fed also perhaps silently declaring war on, on housing as well? Like housing bubbles just got way too extended, and this is our opportunity to just clear that excess. And I don't care how painful it is for folks. 
Um, I think both of those. Um, uh, I think they want housing prices to come down. I think they want rent prices to come down, um, you know, even more than that. Um, rent's a different animal here. Um, uh, and again, it all comes back to the, the problem of the Fed not having housing or considering asset bubbles as part of inflation as being part of the problem that builds up for 10 years before we have a collapse. Um, Which is the, crazy, though, just because shelter is such a huge part of CPI. <laughs> it is. Shelter is 32 percent of the CPI, but not home prices. OK, so the uh, home prices are not directly in the CPI. They're not directly in the PCE. And if you compare the PCE to um, uh, the CPI, there's housing is a, a rent is what you're talking about is a far, far smaller. I don't have the exact percentage for the PCE, but it's it's way less a percentage of the PCE than the, than the CPI. And the reason is the PCE um, includes all of the expenses paid on behalf of um, uh, of consumers, notably, you know, uh, health care. So the, the, the CPI has a bigger percentage in healthcare because it's paid, you know, directly, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, you know, any increases, you know, in those expenses filter into the PCE. Um, they don't because in the CPI, if your employer is paying that for you, you know, even if you're an individual person bank buying your own health insurance you look at the cpi it says it's going up two or three percent or whatever when it's gone up a hundred percent for you well you're in the minority because most of the people uh, uh have have a company paying at least some of their health care expenses so you know that's really underpriced in the cpi if you would which gets all back down to my argument that you know part of the problem is they're just looking at consumer expenses ig totally ignoring bubbles until the bubbles blow up which is which is you know where we're at here right now right all right so i hate to do this mike but i gotta start landing this plane um yep. just time wise we're running away over um it's all great obviously just gonna have to be back on to keep hammering through all this um so let me do get quickly to your market outlook here before we close up so you said that the the markets have not priced in this prolonged recession that we see ahead. Um, how overvalued do you think they are right now? Fifty percent. You know, pardon me. Fifty. I, th I think I think prices can. Uh, uh, I think prices need to collapse at least fifty percent from the top. That's a bare minimum. But you really did want to discuss on jobs, and and so you know somehow we we didn't get there. So let me try and get there. The reason okay. why I think um, unemployment rate is not going to fall, well, I touched upon part of it. I think we're going to have the exact opposite of the COVID recession. Uh, uh, instead of uh, short and steep, you know, long and, and very shallow, we have, you know, 20 million people of uh, retirement age who are still working. When they hit 65, they are going to retire. They're going to be replaced. They might be replaced with part-time workers, but guess what? If you're working part-time, if you're working even one hour, you're considered employed. So um, uh, to be unemployed, you have to be not working and want a job. There's, there, there's uh, uh, with, with, with all the boomers retiring, um, with still sort of shortages right now, in uh, the hot leisure and hospitality sector, um, we're going to see those openings decrease before we're going to see anybody laying off. And then before we see anyone laid off, we're going to see their hours reduced, all at a time when we have millions of people hitting a 2 million this year, hitting age 65, and are going to be either retiring or working few hours. They're going to have to be replaced. You know, that in a nutshell is why I don't think we see this huge spike in the unemployment rate, even if we see 
a steep decline in actual employment. So there's two different, two things, the unemployment rate and actual employment, and one needs to understand the difference. We can have a huge rise in unemployment without the unemployment rate going up. That's going my up. argument. Okay, great. And, and all right, and that I think, going to have you back on to dig more deeply into that, because um, certainly the calculations, I think you and I can, in many ways, poke a lot of holes in the, in, in the methodology that's used to do all that. Um, I get your point about, look, there's just a lot of boomers that are going to be coming out of the system, given how big uh, that cohort is, and it's it's nearing, re- or it's in re- the retirement age years now, or entering the retirement age years now. Um, there's one factor I would put in there is, is I would posit that the percentage of boomers who can afford to retire is lower than for previous cohorts, yes. which may be offsetting the retirement clock a bit. A bit. Um, but then then you throw deaths into there too. So, I mean, there's, it's, it's, it, you can make arguments on both sides, but, but let's save that for next time. Um, all right. So um, you gave us your, your concerning uh, or, or gave us your concern that markets are substantially overvalued here. If you think that, that they'll be, you know, yeah, I said 50% from the last. top. That was for the S and P, you know, I think uh, 65 or 75% would actually be normal for technology. Um, uh, so, you know, that's another steep decline from here. You know, my, my S and P, you know, line was around 22, 24 hundred. Okay. So uh, um, that's a really, really steep decline for here. And, uh, you know, for there to be huge problems, I don't even have to be that right. The, if the stock market went nowhere for, and this is a whole nother discussion, if the stock market went nowhere for five years, you know, we don't see any of the decline that I just mentioned, but pension plans are severely in trouble anyway, right? All right, Mike, let's earmark that for the next time you come back on. We'll talk more about the mechanics of, of what may happen in employment, but let's also talk about the, the pension, uh, you know, looming liability out there and, and what a recession would do to that, because I think that is a big major factor. Um, real quick on the uh, the investing side of things. You're not a professional um, asset manager, no. um, but uh, I'm just curious, uh, you know, if you've got any sort of general recommendations for for strategies that folks should consider, given the type of environment that we're looking at going into this year. And I'll give you one example to react to is for the first time in forever, um, you can get paid to sit in safety and liquidity to see how all this works out. Right. And so, you know, it, 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 looking at short term UST bills right now, they're more attractive than they've been in an awfully long time. And in a, a, a period of uncertainty like this, where we have the the probabilities of, of a big downtrend at some point in the not too distant future, parking some cash in treasuries seems like maybe a prudent thing to do. I, I think so. I think so. And uh, I think you even did a video on that explaining uh, people maybe want to link to that, you know, here in this one. Uh, explaining, you know, you know how to, you know how to go to Treasury Direct and, and buy these Treasuries, but the thing is that we need to keep in the back of our minds on an individual basis. You and I can make that decision. We can say, you know, okay, I want to pull my money here out of stocks and put them into Treasuries and just wait out whatever is going to happen here. You and I can make that decision, but in aggregate, it can't be done because uh, for every share of stock sold, there has to be a buyer of that. So someone, um, probably pension plans, um, are going to ride this decline all the way down to the bottom. And, uh, or if it soared, we, would, we could say the same thing. But the, interestingly, despite this acid, absolute mammoth bubble that we've blown here in the stock market, pension plans in general are still extremely underfunded. Illinois is an absolute disaster case. And um, there are other states, I believe, that are disaster cases too. So someone is going to be, even if you and I can decide to sit this out in cash or in treasuries, 
or you know make our own choices. Some of my readers are are still big advocates of energy, and um, you know maybe they're right because uh, uh, I think energy is going to be needed a lot longer than uh, the Biden administration hopes for. But um, while we can make those choices in aggregate, it's impossible. So if the stock market falls. 50 or 70%, there is no escape in aggregate. And that's a sobering thought, Adam. Yeah. All right. Well, look, um, we have a lot of individual investors watching this channel. So to your point, they are the people that can take these steps for themselves. Obviously, folks, if you're depending on a pension uh, and you're concerned by Mike's comments, um, definitely get in touch with the folks managing your pension and you know try to get a sense for how they are uh, planning to navigate the type of future that Mike and I have talked about here. Mike, as we wrap up, um, for folks that have really enjoyed this conversation and would like to know how to follow you and your work, where should they go? On Twitter, I'm Mish, G-E-A, M-I-S-H, G-E-A, as in Global Economic Analysis. Mish is just the first two characters of my first and last name, Mike Shedlock. And on uh, my blog, my economic website is mishtalk.com. And if I can put in a plug for my photography, Adam, uh, I've got a I've got a photography uh, website, Mish Moments, M I S H Moments dot com. That's Moments with an S. Please check it out if you're uh, at all interested in photography. I've got a section at the top uh, uh, where it says Mish's articles, and I write about how I took the pictures that I took. You might be interested in that. All right. And having been a longtime follower of uh, Mish Moments, uh, you've got some beautiful photos in there. I know there's one you just took recently out in my state um, in uh, Yosemite of uh, the Firefall out there. And those are just beautiful images. Maybe if it's all right with you, I'll, I'll overlay one here, Mike, so folks can get a sense of what your work looks like. Thanks. Um, all right. Real quick and just wrapping up, folks, um, just want to remind folks that the Wealthion online conference on Saturday, March 18th is coming up real fast. It's less than two weeks away. If you haven't registered yet, you did just miss out on the early bird price discount. But don't worry, there is still a last chance to save discount if you register before this coming weekend. Um, it's not as much as the early bird discount, but it's still better than the general price that tickets are going to rise to in the last week here before the conference. To uh, go lock in that last chance to save price, just go to wealthion.com slash conference. You can find all the details about the conference there too, including all the speakers. And don't forget, everybody who registers, whether you watch live or not on the day itself, will be sent replay videos of all the presentations and all the live Q&A interactions with the guests. Um, just a reminder for folks uh, that, yeah, it's a really challenging environment out there for the individual investor. Um, highly recommend that most people work under the guidance of a professional financial advisor and one that takes into account all of the macro trends and risks and issues that Mike talked about here in this interview. Um, if you've got a great advisor who's already doing that for you, excellent. If you don't, or if you'd like uh, a second opinion from one who does, especially one that can help you put together a personal portfolio strategy, but then help execute it for you, feel free to schedule a free consultation with one of the financial advisors endorsed by Wealthion. To do that, just go to Wealthion.com, fill out the short form there, only takes a couple of seconds. These folks will sit down with you, they'll listen to your personal story, they tell you what you think you should do. It doesn't cost you anything, there's no commitment to work with them, it's just a public service that they offer. All right, folks, well, if you enjoyed this conversation with Mike, would like to see him back on this channel in the future, please do us a favor and support this channel by first hitting the like button and then subscribing by clicking the red subscribe button below and the little bell icon right next to it. And I want to emphasize the subscribing part because we are almost at 250,000 subscribers for this channel. Wealthion is not quite yet two years old. I would love to pass the quarter million mark before we hit our two-year birthday for this channel. So if you can help us out, I'd greatly appreciate it. Mike, it was wonderful having you on the channel, buddy. I hope we have you back on again soon. Oh, my pleasure, Adam, and look forward to coming back. Thanks. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching.